Hey, this is John in Seattle. And when I'm not telling terrible dad jokes to anyone who will listen, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and my weird holiday calendar says it's both National Sloppy Joe Day and National Awkward Moments Day. And yes, because we have the Sloppy Joe already on the podcast, that means today I'm going to call out an awkward moment. That time you fire your financial advisor. How do you thread that needle to hire the right person? Do you need an advisor at all? Lucky for you, today we welcome the author of How to Find the Perfect Advisor, Nicholas Stuller. Plus, in our headline segment, listener Jane sent us a note about marijuana socks. Jane, marijuana? Okay, dude, that's awesome. What if owning a stock came with unintended consequences? Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to JB, field a question from Mark, and as if this weren't enough of a sacrifice... I'm going to show up again later in the show to perform my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who are the sloppy Joe and awkward moments on this podcast. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-G. I love sloppy Joes. Mm, Pass. And you love awkward moments. Hey there. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter here for another Monday. And across the table from me, it's my good friend, OG. All of us have regular coffee mugs. Joe is drinking out of his uh, Ferrari. buy a Ferrari, get a coffee mug. Right. Uh, do not buy a Ferrari. Get the coffee mug instead and get to sit at the card table in a basement oh. mug. Yes. Well, there's that. It is fantastic. Hey, we uh, pretended before that we were actually done with our meetups around the country. And we said, thank you to everybody, but we have to say (laughs) this is our first actual recording since we've been back. We had a fantastic time in both San Francisco. We had rotten weather that day. Rotten weather. Thanks to everybody who came out. We had uh, a couple people drive a couple hours, which was cool. I know that's crazy. And then Seattle, man, Seattle came out. What do you think there were? 35 people there? Yeah, yeah, somewhere in that range. I do know. I felt bad for the people. You notice they have people sitting at tables uh, around. I did. <laughs> well, that's that's the restaurant's fault. I told them what was happening. And when we first got there, they're like, okay, well, as soon as your party's here, you guys can be seated. And um, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that's not what's happening. Yeah, we are not. You can, get, you can get rid of the tables and the menus. We're going to stand here and talk. And that's – we stood over people eating – around us yeah i felt pretty bad for those people i did feel bad it was great though to see so many people uh tori dunlop who was just Mm -hmm. featured by the way in market watch and yahoo finance on pace to save a hundred thousand dollars by the time she's 26 years old started saving when she was nine how about that tori was (laughs) there we had uh our friend paulette perhatch was there Yep. Uh, and tons of fantastic stackers. Good to see people who were out last year, too. In last Seattle. year, too. Yeah. Yeah. In um, in San Francisco, a couple of our favorite fintech founders, Aditi Shaker, was there from the Zeta app that helps couples manage their money. Mm-hmm. And uh, Abby Chow from uh, College Backer was there, along with uh, lots of other fun people. Man, we had a great time. Gave away some books. Gave away some swag. It was a great time. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Maybe we'll do it again. I I hope so. Let's talk briefly, OG, about the way that maybe we'll make the money, save up the money to do that again. Thanks to Magnify Money for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Magnify Money is a place where you'll save 450 bucks. How far will $450 get us? That's a lot of beers. I was going to say that would take care of about one bar tab. <laughs> that would one, one meetup bar tab. If you went to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you know what you'll find? Those banking products you use are probably not best in class. FDIC says that the average person has a savings account rate of 0.06. And at magnify money, there are many paying over two. 
percent. And if you want to see the place where you can see all of the stuff online, well, 92 percent of them actually compared and contrasted against each other, everything from student loan refinances, auto loans, if you have to have a loan for your next car, want to pay cash if possible, by the way, for your depreciating asset to savings accounts, checking accounts, whatever it might be. Magnify Money has all those tools you use every day to help you compare, ditch, switch, and save. Also, you can stack more Benjamins with Airbnb. Thanks to Airbnb for sponsoring this episode. Whether you're looking for some side cash or a steady income stream, hosting on Airbnb just might be the best investment you haven't yet made. Head to airbnb.com forward slash SB to start hosting and learn about a hundred dollar Amazon gift card offer for Stacky Benjamin's peeps. Terms and conditions apply. How about that? 550 bucks plus you're hosting on Airbnb, which is even more money. And now you got your next meetup paid for. It's exactly how we do it. We got Nicholas Stuller here today. Nicholas is going to tell us how to avoid hiring a bad financial advisor, since that's a question we get all the time. How do I avoid the bad ones? Find a good one. Nicholas is going to help us out. But first, we got some headlines. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our first headline was uh, sent to us by our friend Jane, who listens to the show. Jane found this piece on federalnewsnetwork.com. This is written by Scott Musioni. What if you owned a stock OG and it came with unintended consequences? Like lifetime of retirement income? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. What if it, what if it were to Dividends be rising faster than inflation? <laughs> uh, could I go on? Yeah. Those would be great. No, the this, magic. This is a bad one. How about this? Owning marijuana stocks may skunk your security clearance or chance of getting one. If you work for the Defense Department, owning one of the most talked about and potentially lucrative stocks on the market may put your job in jeopardy. The Department of Defense Consolidated Adjudications Facility's current legal position is that ownership of marijuana stocks is considered involvement in drug-related activities and would be a, quote, reportable incident under the continuous evaluation process potentially yep. could lead to the loss of security clearances for service members, contractors, and DOD civilians. Owning the stocks could prevent someone from gaining a security clearance as well. Yeah, this was brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago from a client who works for the government and kind of said the same thing. Like, there's more to follow on this, but this memoranda came down. And how safe am I? And the thing that's really frustrating about it, of course, it's really easy to check off the boxes of the stocks not owning them. And this, by the way, is not terribly unusual. You know, people having restrictions on which stocks they can own. Different companies have different rules on that. If you, for example, work for a public auditor like uh, Deloitte or something like that, they've got a list of companies that you're not allowed to own because you represent them and you might have insider information and that sort of thing. So having security restrictions is not terribly off the reservation. The issue is, of course, as you're going to read here in a second, it also extends allegedly to pooled assets like mutual funds and ETFs. That's the one I've got a problem with. Yeah, because how do you how do you look through all of your mutual funds and all of your ETFs and see if there's marijuana related stocks in there? Or if you check it today, how do you prevent it from happening tomorrow? How, a, how frequently do you have to be involved in this to prevent it? What's a, what's a reasonable assumption? Like, yeah, I checked it on January 1st and we were safe. And please don't go trading anything based on speculation. But the speculation that we've all heard, or actually those of us that follow cannabis stocks have heard, is that companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi are considering being involved in that industry. And also we've had people that manage money on here. I remember the manager of the vice fund. Remember when he was on, he was yeah. talking about how a lot of these tobacco manufacturers, very easy for a cigarette manufacturer to get into, into weed. They already have the facilities. Turns out they already know how to make people highly addicted <laughs> yeah. to really bad things. <laughs> well, that was a rumor until it wasn't a rumor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, until it turned out it it uh, actually was addictive. But turns out, yeah. 
Yeah, but they already have the facilities to do this. So it isn't a stretch to see Altria Group getting involved in uh, the hemp game. Well, and how do you how do you keep track of all of that? Basically, you know, it just seems really, really, really difficult. And the good workaround always has has always been to use ETFs and mutual funds because you don't have that direct ownership. You don't have the direct trading responsibilities. You don't have the direct responsibility for putting stuff in or taking things out, so to speak. So I find it really frustrating that the original position, I think they've got to change this very soon, but that the original position is even if your mutual fund owns it, you stand the chance of getting in trouble. Uh, That's a really big penalty for a lot of people. So hopefully the lawyers can get together and sign off on it being okay in the mutual funds. I think there's a, there's a wider net here that we should cast though, which is this isn't just around marijuana stocks. Increasingly we're seeing reports of employers looking at your credit card debt, right? Asking for your credit report and your credit report could affect your ability to get a job. So this innocuous to you expense or this one 60 day late that you think might not be that big a deal might stop you from getting your next job. Everything is starting to get more and more related because people can continually build algorithms around behavior, money behaviors and outcomes and try to figure out how this predictive. I mean, we saw it change the the car insurance industry probably a decade and a half ago when they started using the insurance score, which is very similar to your credit score. And as your credit score got better, your car insurance rates got better. Huh. And really frustrating to somebody that had a really bad credit, but was a good driver, you know, because some algorithm somewhere said that's predictive of being irresponsible. So you are likely to take risks when you drive as well. Very difficult to separate, you know, your personal life, your money life, your business life these days. So it's increasingly more and more important to get all that stuff buttoned up. Woman quoted in this piece, Carol Thompson, partner at the federal practice group said to the federal news network, If you hold a security clearance or applying for one, it's wise to go through your investments and understand what you're investing in. Quote, I would advise against knowingly investing. If there's a situation where an investment's made, you don't know about it. But once you do know about it, you can take certain steps to eradicate or fix that. Then certainly that'd be something in your favor. Not rocket science there, OG, but something I think we should all take to heart. Our second piece comes to us from Bloomberg. This came out a couple of weeks ago. And unfortunately, because of our travel schedule, we weren't able to get to it. But I think enough people haven't heard about this other shoe dropping in this story that we should talk about it. Many of us heard about this uh, founder of a cryptocurrency exchange passing away and having the only have having the only password to get into the wallet that held all the money. Uh, Bloomberg reports, and this by Doug Alexander, Quadriga crypto mystery deepens with cold wallets found empty. When Quadriga Fintech Solutions Corp founder Gerald Cotton died, account holders feared the encrypted access keys needed to recover $190 million Canadian, that's $143 million U.S., of cryptocurrencies held by the exchange and offline storage could be lost forever. It looks now like the storage Quadriga is known to have used, dubbed cold wallets, have been empty since April. This marks the latest twist for a Vancouver-based digital exchange that shuttered operations at the end of January, leaving 115,000 customers out of pocket for about 260 million Canadian in cash and cryptocurrencies. The firm's been under court-approved creditor protection since February 5th, and Ernst & Young has been sorting through Quadriga's dealings as a monitor under the process. The monitor's latest report, released Friday, shows troublesome news. Quadriga was primarily run by Cotton using his laptop and his widow as described as normal procedures for transactions as moving, quote, the majority of the coins to cold storage as a way to protect the coins from hacking or virtual theft. Ernst and Young identified six cold wallet addresses used by Quadriga to store Bitcoin in the past. Five of those wallets haven't had any balances since April 2018. And a sixth appears to have been used to receive Bitcoin from another cryptocurrency exchange account and subsequently transfer Bitcoin to the Quadriga hot wallet on December 3rd. The only activity since 
was an inadvertent transfer of Bitcoin into that sixth wallet last month, which, which was disclosed earlier. By the way, the difference for those of you unfamiliar with how this game works, a hot wallet, different than a hot pocket, a hot, <laughs> a hot, a hot wallet. Not much different. Not much is a storage place online it's where you buy and sell and it's hot because you can access it then online. Cold storage means it's not currently hooked up to the internet and so your money it could be is, like a thumb drive or a yeah your money's off, theoretically safe this gets weirder theoretically between people who aren't really sure if this dude's dead like did this guy fake his own death to now it appears the money isn't the money's just missing somebody mm -hmm. somebody took it yeah very intriguing this is the unintended consequence of non fdic or SIPC covered places back to again, unintended consequences like owning marijuana stocks and you work for the yeah. DOD. Yeah. And I think you just have to factor this in from a risk standpoint. Obviously nobody predicted that this young man who was, I don't know, 30 or 35 or something like that would die suddenly. And nobody else also assumed that he would be the only one with the password but maybe he was the only one with the password because there was no money. Because he was, but it's. <laughs> but what did he spend it on? Like, does he have like a nice house or a fancy car? Or something? It just seems strange. I don't know if you've seen the reports about even around his death, like the fact that he passed away. He passed away somewhere remote, like India. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And so all of a sudden, it came out. Well, he died. So, so over time, these wallets have been emptied and then all of a sudden the dude dies and he's dead. Yeah. Mm. Hundreds mm. of millions of dollars are gone and the dude passes away in a remote location. Like Texarkana. Yes. Or India. Or India. <laughs> right next to each other. Very interesting. You ever More see, to follow. You ever see that comedian talk about the, the Middle East and the Midwest? He's no. like, I just don't get maps. Like the Middle East way over here, the Midwest. Like, shouldn't these things be a little closer together? Just Yeah, there you go. Yeah, slightly different places. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think the lesson there might be a big one. We'll have that in a second. But I think a big lesson besides not keeping your money with cryptocurrency is to make sure you know what you're invested in. And actually... Thanks to Magnify Money for sponsoring the show, because Magnify Money is the place where people find out exactly what they're invested in. You know what I like about Magnify Money, OG? I love that fine print score, because yeah. you often get lured in with these very low rates or fantastic opportunities, and you think, oh, it's going to be great. And then the fine print says, yeah, you don't qualify. I had that happen early on with a credit card that I had, where I thought that I was getting a bunch of reward points and I hadn't read all the fine print. And even though I spent the required amount of money, I then paid the card off. The card issuer goes, well, you didn't jump through this little hoop that was in subparagraph four, whatever lesson learned. Magnify money gives you a very quick fine print score, just like a grade on a school paper, A, B, C, D, F. Very, very easy. Whatever happened to E by the way, in grading systems. I used to get E's. Well, no, let me rephrase. I used to know people who got E's. <laughs> used to know some people. It for, means excellent, right? But, F is fantastic. <laughs> D is delightful. Right. Yes. Uh, StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more on that. And I think that, that that is the lesson. Know the fine print on your investments. Uh, if you work for the department, no matter where you work, Know what your company's policy is around what you can own and can't own. Is there a policy around what you can own and can't own? And then secondly, when it comes to crypto, I think the lesson is more to come. Nicholas Stoller upstairs talking to mom. He's the founder and CEO of My Perfect Financial Advisor, which intends to be the e-harmony of matching <laughs> investors or consumers to advisors. Imagine if people swipe right for you, OG. Most do. <laughs> Regardless of how little or how much money one has, Priory was the founding CEO of two of the largest financial advisor database companies in the U.S., 
the nation's largest advisory firms. Mutual funds and insurance carriers have relied upon his companies to understand the financial advisor community. 1985, he started his career. Listen to this. Shearson Lehman Hutton. That's a name. Long time ago. Yes. Now, by the way, they are part of Morgan Stanley. When he left the firm as a financial advisor, he began a successful career selling to financial advisors at firms like Waterhouse Securities, which is now TD Ameritrade. I, I love how he worked at all these places. It used to be things. National Regulatory Services, which is now a Thompson company. Selling to thousands of advisors, he subsequently built sales teams to dramatically increase revenues at the various firms he worked for. He is a guy who intimately knows good financial advisors from bad ones. I loved reading his book, so I was very excited that we could have him on the show because we get this question all the time. How do I find the right financial advisor? Let's say hi to Nicholas Steller. And coming down the stairs right now, it's our new friend, Nick Stoller. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Thank you uh, for having me. Good to see you. Well, this is a topic that's near and dear to OG and my heart, but what would make you want to write a book about hiring the perfect financial advisor? Because that takes a special person to explore that niche. Well, two reasons why I wanted to write this book. Number one, personal experience. My father died when he was 45 years old, left behind five dependents, And the family was the product of both very good advice and very bad advice. The good advice was they had an insurance agent. My parents had an insurance agent friend of theirs that really beat them up, you know, verbally to get insurance. And they were a lower middle income family back in the 50s and 60s. He unfortunately died when he was 45. That was very good advice. They scrimped. And that insurance policy took care of the family for a very long time. Where the bad advice came was, in fact, no advice because in 1973, there were very few advisors that even would talk to a woman, like literally, you don't know what you're doing. And there were virtually none that catered to widows. So the bad advice was no advice. And so that money should have lasted a lot longer than it did. So as I progressed in the financial services industry, I began to dwell on that more saying, wow, I am product of good and bad advice. And then after being in the industry for about 20 years, uh, notably being interviewed quite often, I noticed that the vast majority of the world simply doesn't get advisors. Moreover, they have an aberrant view of what advisors are, which has really been created by the media and the media's focus on the Madoffs of the world, which naturally are newsworthy and can be very interesting. The Wolf of Wall Street, while a great movie, is an aberrant, tiny representation of the financial advice industry and what you never read about are the everyday advisors that are middle income themselves catering to middle income families. And therefore, people that simply don't have an advisor don't know any different. They're literally ignorant in the very definition of the world that there are advisors all around this country to help literally anyone and everyone from every economic strata. So those things combined, I said, I got to write a book one day to really, really not to help advisors, but to help the investors who need the help. I totally agree with the piece about the media, but do you also think it's because of the phrase that you used talking about your parents, Nick, uh, when you said that this insurance salesperson beat them up? Do you think people also that in the industry or people worry about the industry and people beating them up and, you know, doing kind of a timeshare pitch to uh, hire them and buy their products? That is absolutely a true statement. And part of the reason why the industry adopted these really cheesy, you know, in some cases, ridiculous tactics is because when you think about in the abstract, talking to someone about their death, not exactly a fun conversation. No one wants to talk about untimely death. It's the hardest thing in the world to sell. And in this day and age, there's still only about 30% of American families don't have life insurance. I mean, it's really, it's horrible because if you're the breadwinner, something happens, your family is devastated. So the industry kind of felt themselves pushed into a position where they had to use these really cheese ball and, and ridiculous worthy of a TV commercial and a movie kind of tactics because in many cases that got the point across, yeah. across the kitchen table. Now that industry needs to take a more professional approach, I believe, but the fact remains the average person just doesn't want to talk about dying early, dying at a hundred. Sure. That's fine. 
But dying when you're 60 and you got four kids, only two of them in college, two are still in high school. Nobody wants to talk about that. It's very difficult. And yeah. that's why these these things happen. Well, or dying at 45, like your dad. Or 45, like my dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. That's not going to happen. But the one, one thing I found when I was a planner that was worse than that was trying to talk to people about disability. Because you could you could impress upon people that someday you're going to die. But disability, that's not going to happen to me because I'm a safe skier. Uh, great point. Or um, I'm lucky or I'm cautious. Right. I'm a good driver, right. you know, or smoking never killed anybody in my family. You know, right. I'm going to be fine. Right. You know, I drink a lot, but it's OK. I'm <laughs> Irish. It'll be fine. You know, all these goofy. You're right. I mean, disability is even harder. And yeah. and you're just touching on two very obvious components of financial wellness and, and, and wealth management. And there are dozens and dozens more that are either boring, unpalatable, confusing, time consuming. It's a hard thing to be an advisor and get your point across. Do you think we all need financial advisors that everyone should have one? I know it for a fact and not just because of my opinion and my 30 years in the industry, but uh, industry research from, and get these names, Vanguard, Morningstar, Investnet, Financial Engines, Aon Hewitt, and a number of others. The ones I mentioned, by the way, with the exception of Investnet, have consumer-facing white papers based on research going back a decade that shows the average investor is losing three percentage points a year by not having a financial advisor overlook or opine on the portfolio. The loss could even be greater for someone without a portfolio. So whether you're 18 and you don't even go to college you need someone who's objective to look over your shoulder at least once a year to say, hey, here are the things you should be looking at and thinking about. And then it goes all the way up the spectrum. And and the obvious you know, need is the more complicated you are, the more of a need you have. But because the topic is so confusing, it is not a tangible thing, so you can't see it. It changes all the time. And for most people, let's be candid, it's a boring topic. Alpha, beta, gamma, dollar cost averaging, interest rates, it's a snooze fest for the vast majority of Americans. So you need a person who A, is interested in it, B, is expert in it, and a third-party dispassionate person to not be emotional about your health, your wealth, your savings, and to kind of be that independent person, you know, your rabbi, your guru, if you will, to, to say, look, you're being stupid about this. You're I think, literally being dumb about this. You need to le- take, pay attention to the following four things. And I love that, having the outside person that says that, because Cheryl and I, my spouse and I, have an advisor. And the reason isn't that I don't know what I'm doing. And I think a lot of people that listen to this, they're like, well, I know what I'm doing. It's not about that. It's that you, you, you've heard your own BS over and over and over. And my, my wife has heard mine. But to have somebody on the outside, the dispassionate part, I think is probably the really important part of that. It absolutely is. Look, it's hard to watch the Dow Jones Industrial Average tank. You know, I watched it in 87 when I was a rookie broker, and I watched literally thousands of people calling into their brokers at the firm that I worked for who were demanding that their brokers sell. And that day, there were a lot of stocks that you couldn't get a price on. And I would overhear these older brokers. I was a rookie at the time. And they're saying, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Smith, I can't even get a price. I don't think you should sell. Everyone's panicking. And they said, sell anyway. And the broker must do what the client says, locking in tons of losses. And I saw it again in 08 in terms of there were other you know, significant downfalls. But 08 was a calamitous correction. And I had employees of mine say, Nick, what should I do? I'm like, do you need every penny of your retirement tomorrow? And they're like, no. I'm like, don't do anything. It's going to come back eventually. The world is eating more bread. They're using more toilet paper. The, the, the world is expanding in terms of population. You just got to wait it out and people panic. So it's hard in the face of that to be unemotional and make decisions. And imagine if you're sick. Imagine if your spouse loses a job. If your child has a special a medical condition, pick your money issue that has some kind of emotion attached to it. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible for someone to be totally objective. You just, it's so hard. You say in the book though, that we're largely misinformed about advisors. Is it because we don't realize that advisors are largely those dispassionate people weighing in on all different parts, or we think they're just investments only, or what are we misinformed about? We're misinformed about the breadth of the type of advisor that exists. 
that is largely because of, of a couple of drivers. Number one, only the largest of firms can afford to advertise on national TV. So if that's all you see all day long, what is one left to assume? So if you only see these large firms advertising, where it becomes common knowledge, the account minimum is a half a million bucks. So that's one issue. Everyone I talked with all the time says, oh, I'm, I don't have enough money for an advisor. That's because they've never read a story about a thing called an hourly fee-only financial planner. Because maybe Money Magazine writes about it once a year, and they have, what, 600,000 readers? Right. Okay, so that means 90 million households are not reading that story. So that's part of the reason. The other part of the reason is um, the media likes to really talk about the negative bad activities. Therefore, the impression is a lot of advisors are bad, which is simply not a statistical fact. So those are the reasons. People simply are ignorant in the true definition, not the pejorative, but the true definition of the word. They literally don't know any better. They're not taught this in high school and college. It's funny that you say that because what frustrates me is when somebody says, you know, the S&P 500 beat my financial advisor. Your financial advisor is it's not an S&P beater. Like it's, it's, it's an apple and an orange. And the second I hear somebody say that, I think they really don't know what they are. No, they don't. I mean, again, it's a complicated, people don't know what they don't know. And then that same person would be shocked to read the historical facts that most mutual fund investors have a performance measure that is worse than the actual fund they're holding. What does that tell you? It tells you they're making emotional mistakes. Yeah. They're, they're actually underperforming the very instrument they have in their account. How's that even possible? Because... As one example, they sell at the wrong time and they buy at the wrong time because they're unadvised. So, I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because there is this ignorance because people don't read about it. They're not educated. I'll tell you a very funny story. I met a very sophisticated senior manager at a large tech firm about a month ago. This person found out I wrote this book and this person said, wow, you know, it's funny. I've been talking to my advisor and I've always been uncomfortable because I, I can't get a straight answer of when I'm going to retire. I said, okay. I said, is your advisor an asset manager or a financial planner? And the answer was, you know, I don't know. And I said, okay, I'm going to make a statement to you. And this is not insulting you. It's insulting the education you didn't get from your advisor. That's like saying, I don't know the difference between a dentist and a podiatrist. It's almost that bad. A planner and an asset manager to do entirely different things. There are a bunch that do both. But you should at least know what kind of professional you have working for you. And this person's sharp. They make a lot of money. Their spouse makes a lot of money. They've been, they actually support this industry. And they didn't know if they had a planner or an asset manager. It, was, it wasn't shocking. But it's just more evidence of people who are even in the industry simply don't know because no one's telling them. Yeah. The education just isn't there. No, it's so frustrating. And to your point, you know, a lot of that is around the advertising and the big firms that can do that, that are largely asset management companies that sometimes parade themselves as, as, as financial planners. But let's dig into that, though, then, Nick. The process of hiring an advisor. Why don't we start off with the mistakes? Where do people get it wrong when they decide it's time for them to hire a financial advisor? Well, the first thing... Where And I'll start with the most negative, but statistically tiny number of occurrences, but where people get hurt the most is they don't even find out if their advisor is indeed a legal advisor. So the very first thing when you meet somebody, and most people get an advisor, how? Through a, a referral, a friend, a spouse, a cousin, an uncle, inherit it from their parents. The very first thing you should do is find out, are they actually a legal advisor? And there's only two websites to go to, FINRA or the SEC. If they're not on either website, 99.9% .9 of the time, they are not a lawful advisor. And usually when someone's not a lawful advisor, they're operating a Ponzi scheme statistically. You, that's usually what happens. Um, there are some tiny, tiny exclusions. Basically, those kinds of folks can only manage money for people with like 5 or $10 million in the market. And, and it's a tiny percentage. So almost always... Make sure they're actually registered. N number two, okay, so they're going to be in either the SEC or the FINRA database. Look at their record. Most advisors don't have a negative regulatory record. About 7% have some kind of activity on there, negative activity. Some of it is perfunctory. You know, I forgot to fill out a form. About half of that 7% is so bad they shouldn't be in the industry. It's like a criminal's rap sheet. And if you see 7 or 10 or 20 infractions, 
paid fines, you know, didn't do this, didn't do that, got fired, then that's an advisor that is just breaking the rules all the time. Again, it's roughly only 3% of the people in the industry, which is actually is lower than the disciplinary rates of medical doctors and lawyers, believe it or not. But the perception is much different. Yeah. But just check it out. Just don't be one of the unlucky 3%. So that's number one. That's the first thing. Are they in the industry? Check out their record. Then from there, ask them very simple questions. And, and I have these kinds of questions both on my website and in the book. And they're like, what do you, what kind of clients do you have? Let them talk. How exactly do you charge? Tell me exactly how much money that you can, at least in the first one or two meetings, that you're going to make off of me. A good advisor will never have any problem saying, oh, I'm going to make $1,000 a year off of you or 10000 whatever the number. If you don't get a clear answer about how much money the advisor is going to make from the relationship, just leave because it's not a difficult question. It's like buying a car. How much is the car? You don't want to hear an answer of, I don't know, or don't worry about it, you know, or other people pay, pay for it. You want to hear a clear answer. I'm going to make, this is how I make money off of you and this is how much. So these are very simple things to ask. However, emotionally, most people, they don't even know to ask these questions. Yeah. And they're uncomfortable because it's kind of a not so subtle challenge to the advisor. But that's okay. They are a vendor to you, an important one. And you need to know exactly what they're getting paid and how they're getting paid. And, and that's relatively simple. But then ask also, what types of clients do you have? Do you have a lot of clients like me? Do you have a lot of, if you're a widow, do you have other widows? How many widows do you have? Do your widow clients look like me in terms of assets under management or complex financial planning needs? And so there's lots of common sense questions like that that are very helpful to answer. And those are some real quick tips on how to talk to somebody and find out if you've got someone who is above board or maybe they're a little bit shady. I love those. Just doing a little bit of homework beforehand, I think it'll also make you more comfortable going into the meeting, which you're going to have to be comfortable uh, going in and knowing that you've checked out the person's record ahead of time, checked out a little bit about them, and then asking them if they work with people like you. It was funny. I was listening to a, uh, during my morning run a couple of weeks ago, Nick, I was listening to a Tim Ferriss episode and there was a gentleman talking about interviewing anybody. And I found this to be an interesting question that I'll throw in there, which is if you were me, what questions would you ask you? And the gentleman said, <laughs> it was pretty ingenious. He said, you will hear answers that you would have never even thought of. And just if you're interviewing three or four different people for whatever, he was talking about an OB uh, for his child that was being born. And, you know, one OB told him that it's important to have a good NICU close by so that if anything goes wrong, make sure that the natal intensive care unit is good in that hospital. Another person said, you ask the nurses because the nurses always want to work with the best doctors. So ask nurses who the best doctors are. I've, and, and I, I kind of think it might be the same with a financial planner. Like if you ask a financial planner, what do you think I should ask you? Obviously, it's going to be a little bit of a sales pitch. They're going to tell you good stuff, but they also might cover your blind spot. I think that's a great idea. And you're right. The least salesy of the financial planners out there. And in fact, as a sidebar, the industry has gone from being a slick Brooks Brothers wearing suit industry to almost like a nerdy industry yeah. where in fact they're teaching advisors now how to actually be social, believe it or not, <laughs> because things have changed so much and actually for the better of the consumer. Sure. So, but e even the nerdiest advisor w will have a subtle sales pitch in there, but that's a great question. What should I be asking? And then one red flag is advisors who bash the quote unquote competition. Oh yeah. Yeah. You don't want to hear that too much. Like, this is what I do and other advisors don't do this. You don't, you don't want to hear too much of that. You want to get educated by the advisor, but that's a great point. What questions should I be asking? One question I really like advising people to ask is tell me, Mr. Advisor, what you don't do for a living. Oh, that's great. Because there's not one advisor on this planet that ever existed or will ever exist that knows everything about wealth management. It's impossible. There's too much that changes. There's too much to know. And with complex cases, they either go to a, a peer in their firm or they go outside to a friendly advisory firm for advice on whatever, an employee stock ownership plan, a complex tax issue, international issue, pick your kind of topic. So they should be able to succinctly tell you, well, I don't do this. Like, for example, when you talk to an asset manager, they will tell you, I don't do planning. 
I pick stocks, I pick funds. That's what I do. That's what I'm passionate about. If you want a cash flow analysis, I'm the wrong guy. They will tell you that. Conversely with a planner, they will say, I don't invest money. I just do a plan. This is how much I, how much I charge. You have to go elsewhere to implement it. And so what they don't do, and if they can't give you a succinct answer, like within a couple of minutes, that is, is a negative mark on the interview process. You know, and it's not binary. You're not going to hear one answer that's bad and, you know, run yeah. away. Well, there's a couple of exceptions to that, which I can talk about. But it's kind of like you you want you want to rank these kinds of answers and say, okay, let's tally it up. How many good answers did I get? How many not so good did I get? But that's a good one because they should be able to quickly and comfortably, you know, reply to these. And my suggestion has always been do a first quick phone call screen. Don't waste your time seeing them on the first call. Ask a handful of questions, then go see them and go see them with another adult with you. You want to look them in the eye, you want to ask them questions, and you want to write down the answers. Because once in a while, you'll see someone twitching and sweating and and (laughs) clearly not comfortable with the hard questions like, what don't you do? How much are you going to make off of me? And if they can't answer, I mean, it'll be very clear. If, if you can even, if you're even moderately good at reading body language, it'll be clear the person you shouldn't hire. They can't answer some of these questions comfortably. So um, those are some of the things I like to ask as well. Let's say that you pick the right person and uh, it feels like a fit at first. How do you make sure that you get the most out of that relationship, Nick, so that you are using your advisor as effectively as possible? First of all, A client should not be afraid to share everything with their advisor, like everything. You don't want to hold anything back. You really don't because you're only hurting yourself. If in doubt, over communicate. And so you want to tell them all your assets, all your liabilities. If you have a child, if you inherit something, if you got a bad diagnosis, whatever it is, you want to tell the advisor that. And you want to be in touch with them on a regular basis. Once a year is not enough. Uh, Once a month, I think, is perfect. But as a word of caution, you don't want to be calling up your advisor saying, how come we're not doing X, Y, and Z in the market? That's Mm -hmm. not what the monthly check-in is about, you know, if they're managing a portfolio, because it's not about that. Investing is a long time horizon endeavor, but you want to be talking to them about really anything, what's going on in in the industry, what's going on in your life, you know, here's what's going on with me. Every quarter is a good frequency to communicate with your advisor. And you should ask them any and all questions that come to mind. You know, if you're really getting, you know, a lot of peer pressure in your community to invest in Bitcoin, ask your advisor, what do you think about Bitcoin? You know, don't let it worry you that you're missing out. So really, communication is a huge deal. And when they say something to you, when the advisor says something to you and you don't understand those words, do not feel stupid even if it sounds basic, to ask the question. You are stupid as a consumer about all things of investments. That's why you hired an advisor in the first place. You might as well. You're paying them. Ask them every question. Do not hold back. Get educated, and they'll be happy to. They'll be thrilled that you're asking them the questions. You know, And they're going to throw terms at you that you just have never heard before, and most people like that great Schwab commercial just nod and smile because they don't want to appear stupid, and that's a mistake. Because you're making yourself dumber by not getting educated. Right, right. You're, <laughs> and the advisor looks at you and goes, okay, great. I got this smart doctor. He knows what I'm talking about. It's awesome. Fantastic. We've got a great relationship. Awesome. But in fact, the guy has no idea what you're talking about. You don't want that. I used to tell my clients when I was a, a financial planner that I love making a lot of money and not fielding any questions. Like I'm as lazy as the next guy. But if you have open enrollment, I never usually know when that is send that to me, you know, let me help you weigh in on open enrollment for your company. If you buy a car, I don't know everything about buying a car, but I'm certainly a person that can talk about your budget, where that money's going to come from, that type of thing. If you're doing a transaction, like buying a new house, I know real estate people who I've already got to know through other client relationships or professional relationships. So there were all these places where I could help people stop, uh, stepping in it that people didn't think was core to our relationship, but really saved them a lot of money. Yeah. Then that, that's a phenomenal point. And, and the bias of the investor or the consumer is they think advisors are all about managing a portfolio, right? Unless you're an asset manager and that is your profession. But if you're a wealth manager or planner, or whatever jargon you want to use, that's only a tiny part of it. And you're absolutely right. If all of a sudden you see your client at the local Starbucks and he's in a Bentley and you know he can't afford a Bentley. <laughs> right. 
most good advisors will say, Fred, what in God's green earth have you done? Was that given to you? No? Okay. Why do you have a Bentley? You can't, I know you can't afford it. Get rid of that thing. What is wrong with you? Or get, ready, so, to, or get ready to just live in the back seat. Or, or, or you're yeah, right. Did you, or do you no longer have a home? Okay. Right. Well, that might be a good investment. Um, <laughs> but um, here's another thing about taking advantage of the, the advisor. It is uncomfortable for consumers to be open kimono about their lives because they, they subliminally think or quite literally think their advisor wants to sell them something or take advantage of them. So use the old Reagan thing, trust, but verify. I've talked about this and written about this. When you get your statements from your advice, from your custodian or the clearing firm or whoever every month, read the statement, open it up, obvious, but then do something that most people don't do, but they really need to just to make yourself sleep at night. Google the headquarters of the firm that's holding on to your money. Call them cold and say, this is my name. I want you to verify what's in my account. It's a perfect way to verify that nothing's being stolen from you. Because that is precisely what wasn't being done by almost every Ponzi schemer out there. They would create fake statements. And again, a teeny tiny percentage of bad advisors have done this. But to offset the uncomfortable feeling of oversharing with your advisor, just call the, the brokerage firm, whether it's Schwab or it's TD or it's Fidelity or Pershing, whoever is holding on to the securities and the cash. And just they have an 800 number. You call them up. I'm Fred Smith. This is my account number. I want you to verify that my statement is what I'm looking at on paper. And they'll go, yeah. Now, if it's wildly off and you just got the statement and you look at the market, the market is not wildly off, then you got a problem. But that way, you know for a fact that nothing errant is happening with your money. And that could have stopped literally made off and all, or not stopped it, but it would have stopped it very, very quickly. Sure. Yeah. And all these other little tiny Ponzi's that happened. The book is called The Truth Shall Set Your Wallet Free, Secrets to Finding the Perfect Financial Advisor. Nick and I just went through about one one hundredth of all. I I have never read a book about hiring a financial advisor that is as thorough, Nick, as, as your book is here. I mean, you go through everything from A to Z. I absolutely loved it. Where can people get the book? People can get my book, which, by the way, is called... The truth shall set your wallet free <laughs> secrets to finding your perfect financial advisor. And thank you, Joe, for that, your very kind words. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. It's on most online sellers. Uh, it is in a number of Barnes & Noble stores, notably in the Northeast. But yeah, online you can get the book. It's so exciting and uh, was just a great read. I can't, I, and it's funny you said that uh, financial advisors have gone from being salesy to very nerdy. My wife never wanted to go to the holiday parties when I was a financial advisor because it was so nerdy and when I was doing it, so salesy. She's like, no, 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 I want nothing to do with that. And uh, so when you mentioned that, that's why I started laughing that the, the that industry. She's like, nope, I got better things to do. I got to go watch some paint dry. Uh, <laughs> yes, it could be. If you don't have narcolepsy, it will put you into a narcoleptic yes. uh, a state of mind. Which is awesome because this book will actually not. I found it to be a page turner if, in, uh, when you go looking for your advisor. I recommend people look up uh, The Truth Shall Set Your Wallet Free. Nick, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes, man. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Joe. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the best part of this show, my trivia, on National Sloppy Joe Day. It's appropriate to tell Sloppy Joe jokes, don't you think? Here's one, here's one. Joe is so sloppy. Oh, come on. Steve, can you help me out over here? Joe is so sloppy. How sloppy is he? Joe is so sloppy that... Oh, wait a second. I had that joke right here somewhere... Uh, okay. Hey, uh, did I tell you it's also National Awkward Moment Day? Well, okay. How about some trivia, huh? Move quickly. Move quickly. Let's do this one. Okay. Adam Levine, or as we call him around here, Super Bowl Tattoo Guy, is having a birthday today. He's not only the lead singer of pop band Maroon 5, but early on, as a high schooler, was offered his first recording deal with Tommy Allen and John DeNicola. This was a huge win for high schooler Levine because DeNicola had worked on many projects before. But how about this trivia? John DeNicola was best known for writing songs for what Patrick Swayze starring film 
including the song I've Had the Time of My Life. I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. We talk about side hustles a lot, OG, on this show. And thanks to Airbnb for supporting Stacky Benjamins by sponsoring this episode. Whether you're looking for some side cash or a steady income, hosting on Airbnb might just be the best investment you haven't made. You know, it's funny. We talk about investing, investing in different side gigs, like exploring and deciding which side gig would be best for you to get out of debt. There's an investment. An investment in getting better yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're getting out of debt, making more money, getting financial independence earlier. How great is that? By the way, Airbnb also offers a host guarantee, and that helps protect your property and the unlikely event something does go wrong. It's free to list your home, and you're the boss when you host on Airbnb. Host when you want, how you want, list either a single bedroom or the entire place. It's all up to you. I know OG is uh, listing his back seat of his uh, car, in fact, on Airbnb. Huh? No? One of my garages, sure. <laughs> Just a tent in the backyard. There you go. But with all the rooms in your house, I mean, you could mm-hmm. rent one of the three rooms in your house. In the front part, yeah. One of the three in the front part of the house. Rent out the guest wing, the OG guest <laughs> wing. You get your own paper bag when you walk in. It's like a, a weird hotel. Turns out nobody signs up on Airbnb when I list my house with free paper bag when you walk in. If it feels claustrophobic, breathe in and out in this thing for a while. (laughs) It might help calm your panic attack. Yes. Actually, people have a panic attack because they're staying in OG's house. Like, seriously. That would be every time I stayed in my house. Did you have did you have a panic attack? I pinch myself. You were pampered. I seriously pinch myself that I get to stay with uh, with OG. And I have to say, though. The uh, additional cuddling requirement that you have, that's the only time it gets awkward. It's a hug. It's a hug. It's a required bedtime hug. My favorite part was uh, when you got up in the morning and you're tiptoeing down the stairs and then you fell down the stairs with your bag at four in the morning when everyone else is trying to sleep. Then here comes your son like right on your heels. It does the exact same thing. (laughs) Dude, seriously, hey, are you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. Seriously, that last step in the dark, you think yeah. there's one less step than yeah. there is. Yeah, both of you face planted right into the wall. Yeah, it was at, fantastic. At what, like four thirty in the morning? Yeah, nobody woke up either. It was great. No, it was it was it was good. So uh, you should list that room. Okay, I will. I'm just I'm just telling you, make some money. Got it. It's all up to you, man. You could make some extra income, OG, which you could use to pay the bills, fund your travel to go see other stackers, save up for retirement from this podcast. Here's what I like about Airbnb, making money when you travel, which is something Airbnb hosts do. Think about this. You're off traveling and you've guests at your home who are paying for your travel while you're out on the road, making money at the same time. Show off your beautiful house, show off your community or the city, share local pride, strengthen the local economy. Airbnb helps keep you protected with a team available 24-7 to help with any issues, whether that's rebooking assistance, refunds, or their million-dollar host guarantee. For Stacking Benjamins peeps, head to airbnb.com forward slash SB to start hosting, and you're going to get a $100 Amazon gift card if you generate $500 in booking value by May 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Again, receive a $100 Amazon gift card if you generate $500 in booking value by May 30th by heading to airbnb.com slash SB and start hosting. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And while the sloppy Joe joke should be flowing during this part of the show, I can't find that piece of... Oh, oh, here it is. No. Hey, this is funny, though. It turns out today is also National Awkward Moments Day. That's awkward. Let's cut to the trivia, shall we? Today is Maroon 5 lead singer Adam Levine's birthday. In high school, he was offered a recording deal with Tommy Allen and John DeNicola. DeNicola was best known for writing songs for what Patrick Swayze starring film, including the song, I've Had the Time of My Life. Well, of course, the answer is the hit from the... Actually, you know what? Hey, Steve, 
Why don't we just dial up an actual clip of the song to help folks out, okay? Now I've had the time of my life. Did that help you out? Oh, I guess not, but that was truly an awkward moment, wasn't it? Because you actually thought that was a real clip of Bill Medley totally singing the song from the hit movie Dirty Dancing, but it was actually me the whole time. If I was in your seat, man, that would be awkward. I wouldn't want to be you right now. I hope you got it right, though, because you know what? Ain't nobody put trivia in a corner. See ya! Where have I heard that line before? Some crappy movie from a long time ago. You didn't like Dirty Dancing? Uh, no. Come on. Everybody likes that movie. Not everybody. Good music. Ugh. Good stuff. Terrible acting. Terrible dancing. Acting and dancing. Now, if they would have blown up the place. Might as well be in black and white. So old. That'd be even better. Doing that whole movie in black and white. Where are the machine guns and the rocket launchers? That's what I want to know. The jet fighters. You can see Jason Statham going, nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> um, nuke this, I don't know. Get some. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. You need a crossover between that and Full Metal Jacket. Mashup movie. Hey, let's throw out the Avon Lifeline. And Get tackle. to the chopper. <laughs> And tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. And we asked our friends on their Facebook group what two things they value most. And Jen said bacon and bourbon. I smoked some bacon the other day. That was pretty good. I mean, bacon's already kind of technically smoked, I guess, by the time you get it. But is that a euphemism? I smoked some bacon. No, Joe, that's not a euphemism for anything. It's uh, I just just wonder. But bacon and bourbon, what could go wrong? Fantastic. It's actually your loved ones in your time. But if your loved ones have bacon and you have bourbon. It's pretty good. All the above. It's great. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Their application is simple and online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are super affordable. I love, I love, 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 love. We talk about fintech all the time. So happy that uh, Haven Life works with us because that's an industry that can use exactly some of the exciting processes and cleanup that uh, they bring to the table. Uh, today, we're going to throw out Haven Lifeline to our new friend, JB. Say hi, JB. Hello, I call for the shirt, not vice. My name is JB and my wife and I are in our late 20s making mid six figures combined. We currently put close to 50K in retirement vehicles, 401K, Roth, equity in house, et cetera, all the good stuff. All right, so my question is, is what should we invest in? I keep hearing real estate is amazing, but why not just keep putting money into a diversified portfolio that will grow at approximately 8 to 10% a year? Uh, basically what I'm asking are, what are the advantages of one retirement vehicle over the other? Thanks for nothing again. Thanks. Bye. The passion of his question is palpable. You can tell it really matters to him, the answer that we give based on his uh, initial response of, I'm just here for the t-shirt. So his question is, uh, why pick a certain asset class or over another? You know, some people like to invest in real estate. They're investing in equities. Why not do a little bit of both? And you're exactly right. There is no right answer to do any of those things. It's uniquely personal. And if, if from a investing standpoint, it makes the most sense and it's easy for you to manage and and it's uh, accomplishing the goals that you're looking for, then then you're good. If real estate's a better option for you based on the circumstances that you have or the expertise or whatever the case may be, then you transition to that. But that's and that's why it always begins with your goal, because the mess of investments, OG, that are out there, why take a chance on some investment class because you heard it might be the good thing or it might be the hot thing? Forget all that. Start with the end in mind, and I think you're much more likely to, to, to pick the right investment instead of going why one versus the other. Somebody literally asked me the other day if they should buy a hotel. 
Cool. And I said, I, I said, is this like, are we talking about like Monopoly? Like, what do you mean? You already have four houses and now you're trying to upgrade to a hotel? No, 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 no. The real estate's awesome. I just figured I'd just go right to the end. Almost like it, literally they thought about it like Monopoly. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think it works that way. Also, the more complicated you make your life, the higher likelihood it is that you're going to blow it up anyway. So this is across the board. What works for you may not work for other people, which is why the the general advice of, well, you can only get rich in real estate or you can only get rich if you buy stocks or you can only get rich if you do this one thing. It's BS. Everybody's situation is unique. You know, if you don't feel like managing a real estate portfolio, then I guess it'd be pretty stupid to buy real estate, you know, so... Do what suits you. And I like this idea of starting off the, the, the hull of your ship being what you know. If, if multiple asset classes fit your goal, start with the one that you're most familiar with. And don't completely load up on that. Like I can't stand seeing somebody that only owns rental real estate as an example, with very low liquidity, has nothing else in their portfolio, you have to round it out. But if you lead yep. with the thing that you know and work from there, uh, I'll, I'll give you another example of G. I had a client who we, back when I was a financial planner, we, we looked at all the different investments out there and he was intimately familiar with raising cattle with his dad. They were professional farmers and he said, you know, I could go buy this stock and maybe get 10%. I could go buy cattle with my dad and maybe get 10%. And we talked about all the downsides and he specifically knew what all those downsides were. Like this guy wasn't the average guy going, Hey, I heard you could get 10% <laughs> raising cattle. He, he knew what it was. So in his financial plan, different than any other person I worked with my entire career, his main investment was cattle. With his dad, full well yeah. knowing that if the whole herd gets sick and they have to slaughter it and, you know, mad cow disease, whatever it might be, like we had that built right into his plan. He knew the right. downside. He knew it intimately. So lead with that. But was that all he had? No, he had a he had a nice large cap, small cap, international diversified stock portfolio outside of that, had a well-funded cash reserve, um, actually did have a rental property, but we led with what he knew. So I think... Uh, Good stuff there. Thanks for the question and, and the passionate question JB had. Seriously, I think he just wants the shirt, but that's fine because it's an awesome shirt. And uh, we'll send JB out that code for the shirt. Our second question is from Mark. Mark OG wrote us a war and peace here. And I'm going to see if I can maybe cut this down so that it's not uh, four hours on the podcast asking Mark's question. Mark says, is it a good idea to convert my traditional IRA to a Roth IRA? Yes. There it is. Easy. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Mark. Let's go over his criteria. He says, if so, and if I do a partial conversion every year, should I start now or wait until my taxes might be lower when I get to financial independence? My goal is to be financially independent around 60. That gives me roughly 10 years to do partial conversions. If you don't have enough information about my situation, then what points should I consider? Says he's 48 years old, incomes between 170 and 210, fully funding the Roth 401k and an HSA, total family investments around 900,000 in tax advantage and taxable accounts, 290,000 in the traditional IRA, the account that's currently under discussion, 340,000 in his 401k, $85. I think it's $85,000 in a Roth IRA, $65,000 in his, in his uh, spouse's Roth IRA. For taxable investments, has about $130,000 in an investment in an M1 finance account. He says, for which he learned about here on Stacky Benjamins, the greatest money show on earth. So far, he's right. And only debts the house has an emergency fund, college cover for two kids, and uh, fully insured. And of course, as I mentioned, goal to be financially independent at uh, 60 years old and earlier if, if, if possible. The thing about converting qualified assets to Roth assets is trying to predict what the tax rates are going to be in the future. And you have to assume that you don't know what that is. We can look into the future and say, here's what they are presently, but we're again, one, one Congress or one president away from that all changing. So if, if your income allows it or your cash flow allows it, and you can top up a tax bracket. Let's say that you look into the future and you say, 
when I get to retirement, I'm going to have all this social security income. I've got this huge portfolio. And if I don't do anything, I'm going to be in the top tax bracket, which presently is 35%. But I can pay taxes on that today at 22%, let's say. Well, maybe you've got $15,000 of room this year between your taxable income and the next bracket going from 22 to 24, maybe. And you decide, okay, fine, I'm going to pay 22% on this 15,000 just to fill up that bracket. Now, if you're going from, you know, 30 to 35 or something, maybe, maybe you don't necessarily want to do that because, because you don't know exactly know what the, what the tax brackets in the future are going to look like. That's the big gamble. But I think it's safe to say that relatively speaking, the current tax rates are pretty low and I wouldn't let, especially in the lower tax brackets, you know, if you find yourself in that 12% range or something like that for people that maybe don't make as much income, I wouldn't let a year go by without maxing that bracket out in terms of a conversion, generally speaking. It's almost like not letting a year go by without maxing out your Roth if you have the opportunity. Because you can't go back and say, well, I didn't use that all, so I want to go back and do it. When you get in those higher brackets, it becomes a little bit more of a guessing game. One of my favorite books on investing, not because it's an exciting read, if you go read this book, Buyer Beware, because it is, it is boring, but the dude makes some fantastic points. It's a book from the late 90s called Trading Rules. And one of my favorite points, OG, that I want to put a dot on what you just said around is you're going to make better financial decisions and better investing decisions if you give up trying to predict the future. If you like it today and it's great today, do it. Mm -hmm. Don't try to predict where things are going because you're always going to be wrong. And, and I really like that. And he was specifically, by the way, at the time, not talking about taxes, but I think it applies. He was actually talking about people that go, well, I think that this, you know, I think that the market's going to do X, Y, Z in the next few months. So I should buy this stock now. And we get letters about that all the time. Hey, do you think I should back away? Do you think I should do it? He goes, no, no, no. If you think the price is good where it is, buy it. You have no idea what the market's going to do. And the second you give away playing Nostradamus and thinking you know anything is when you have the prerequisite fear that you really should have if you're an investor and you're going to do the right thing. I yeah. absolutely love that advice. And I think it's true here. It seems like a good idea, doesn't it? To look at the tax bracket line where it is right now, convert that much money over to a Roth every year, do partials between that and the amount that he can easily stomach through his cash reserve and do it. If he likes it, do it. Well, and the other way of doing that too would be if his workplace plan allows Roth contributions and you're right at that limit, as opposed to going through all the rigmarole of trying to do a conversion, you could just do your contributions into the Roth side of the 401k. If you're going to contribute, let's say $19,000 this year, to your Roth, if you're going to do a $19,000 conversion, why not just do a $19,000 contribution to the Roth? It's going to have the same tax impact as converting, basically. So you can kind of play with those from a, from a tax standpoint as well. Thanks for the question, Mark. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail for the Haven Lifeline, and we will answer your question. That's going to do it for today, I think. The uh, last thing is OG and his firm are taking clients. So get your checklist together that, that uh, Nicholas and I talked about when you, when you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG and uh, get ready to put a great financial planning team in your corner. That's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned? Well, Joe, I don't know what anybody else learned, but here's what I took away from today's episode. First, take some advice from Nick Stuller, who is the third party in your corner who knows about reaching goals but isn't emotionally invested. Isn't it time you find your own coach? Second, work for someone besides yourself. Maybe it's time to look at your investments and social media presence to make sure you don't get an unpleasant surprise when your boss decides to hold your investments or social media against you. But the big lesson? Probably wait until any other day, literally any other day, to try and score a date to the Sizzler. I just texted uh, uh, someone, and she wrote back, uh, happy awkward moment day. Yeah. Big thanks to Nick Stuller for joining us today. You'll find his book, The Truth Shall Set Your Wallet Free, wherever you find 
books. But uh, if you support independent bookstores, you can also use our link, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Powell's, to help the show and order through Powell's. Duh. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Thanks to Joe's mom for the sloppy Joes. No better way to celebrate the end of another great episode than a handful of greasy ground beef and this weird tomato sauce stuff. Speaking of greasy, though, in two days, we're going to slide into another episode with more of your letters. Come on down and join us on Wednesday. I have to tell a funny story real quick, and then we can talk well, about the other thing. You, your mileage may vary on funny, but it's a story. Okay. So next week we're going on spring break to the mountains. Cheryl keeps asking me, by the way, every day where you're going. And I'm like, yeah. I keep forgetting to ask. But you've told me like six times that you're going yeah. to the mountains. <laughs> yeah, we're going to Colorado. And so they have a winter storm warning this weekend. And then we're off by like four days. And I really hope it snows like hell when we're up there because it'll be kind of fun. But anyway, it's, we're taking my mother-in-law and she goes, oh, thank God, you know, that's not going to happen when we're up there. And I said, oh, it'll probably snow every day. And she goes, what's the name of the mountain range we're going to? And I wrote back, the Rockies. <laughs> 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 but anyways, so how about the uh, folks down there in uh, South Carolina all sitting there with bated breath? Who's going to cash the $1.5 billion dollar? Mega Millions or Powerball, whatever it was. And uh, the days are ticking by. Days are ticking by. Nobody's claiming it. Nobody knows who it is. Showed up last week. It took forever. It's such a fantastic story, though, because this person did it exactly the right way. Well, as far as you can tell, anyway. One of the things that I read about when I was reading this story a couple of months ago about how nobody had come forward was... A, maybe they were waiting until the new tax year for whatever reason. <laughs> like, like it makes that big of a difference. You're cashing a hundred, you know, well, a billion and a half dollars. Maybe the town that they lived in is so small, right? That if all of a sudden Billy doesn't show up for work the day after the lottery, everybody knows Billy won. And he decided or she decided, I don't want that to be me. I don't want people to just automatically assume that I'm the one that won it. You know what I mean? because of all the stuff that goes with it. They said in the news report that uh, they had retained a firm in um, New York to be the personal representative, cash the, uh, you know, go and cash a check, direct all media inquiries and that sort of thing. And you could think that over the last four months or five months, because it was running out of time, that they must have gone through and vetted attorneys and vetted financial planning teams and vetted tax accountants and all this other sort of stuff, because... Do you know what the lump sum was, Joe? It was a little walking around money. Yeah, wasn't it like eight hundred million? Eight hundred and eighty million dollars before taxes. So it's that's pretty awesome. So smart. So I have not read the piece yet. So they came out anonymously. Yep. An attorney claimed it. But I just think it's great. I mean, it's a good lesson in just about anything that is kind of sudden money. Whether that sudden money is a million dollar inheritance from great grandma or 
you know, or a billion dollar lottery ticket, probably the right thing to do is to just sit on it for a little while. Well, you it, know, it's also a great idea. Get your team together because even, even this idea of interviewing several different people, like you're going to start learning what you need to know just by the stuff that the team asks. There was a recent uh, Tim Ferriss interview that I was telling you about when we were on the road and the, the guy was talking about putting together great teams. And I really enjoyed the interview, but sometimes, you know, you learn from these experts, what questions you should even be asking. One of the best questions you can ask an expert is, so if you're me, what questions would you be asking? Right. Well, I would just like to be in the room when the guy walks in and says, <laughs> interviewing financial planning people, right? But I guess that's why you have the attorney. So the attorney does the interview and says, we have a client who does this, you know, who has this. I yeah. mean, my goodness. I would just like to be the person who has, after taxes, four or five hundred million dollars and then just let the power of compounding get me back to a billion. Like, I've got seven years until I get my name on the billionaire list. <laughs> Well, maybe longer because I'd buy a Ferrari or something. So let's say that they do none of this homework and they meet with one of those cheesy insurance salespeople who do. Oh, God bless America. That guy would be retired too. Who t- it's like the power of a Powerball keeps on giving. Who tell them to put it into a equity indexed annuity. Mm, delicious. And they get a 6% commission on that deal. Well, that, would be in the, that would be in the first year. In the first year, they get a 6% commission. The advisor yeah. gets fifty-two million dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's a gift that keeps on giving, Joe. Fifty-two million dollars. <laughs> then eight million a year for the next three years. You know how many rubber chicken dinners at Holiday Inn you can buy people for that money? I don't know that you'd need to anymore. I think you might uh, just let that thirty-day free look period go by, and you're just holding your breath that entire time. Come on, baby! Oh, baby. Coming in hot. Take them on a thirty-day uh, vacation. Like you just chum them up for 30 days. <laughs> so they don't. I'm giving you a free 31 day vacation around yeah, the away world. Away from the internet. No internet. You just totally detox. <laughs> just got to sign this form. <laughs> just chill out for 31 days while this check clears. Exactly. All right. Time to go. See ya.